Welcome to the Bass Vlog. Right, this is part of the Insta Vlogs. You'll be seeing this on Cyborg Alpha TV. Uh, as you know, we've begun the net. We've begun the uh, network now, Cyborg Alpha TV Network. So this is going to be the announcement for that, and uh, give you some content that will be related to uh, the uh, to uh, <laughs> Cyborg Alpha TV Network. This is specifically to the Bass Vlog. The Bass Vlog stands for the Byzantine and Antiquities. Uh, uh, Byzantine Antiquities Studies vlog. So that BAS is Byzantine Antiquities Studies. And the vlog is specific to this. And as I said before, a vlog is a vlog. It is a log, or I should say, a video log. These are the notes that come into uh, the research. So these are research notes. These are research-oriented notes. And as such, uh, we will be maintaining a research oriented uh, style so there is going to be more content here there's going to be uh, more in-depth discussion here uh, so this is something that should be expected and it's going to be on the half hour format just the way uh, uh, BTS vlog is on the half uh, on the half hour format this is going to be on the half hour format but it's going to be rather than being uh, multiple topics spread across a variety of different um, Institutes. This is going to be specific to the, uh, the Byzantine and Antiquities uh, uh, Byzantine Antiquity Studies. So let me give you the time and date stamp. It is 22 hours and 40. Uh, should say it's 21 hours and 45 minutes into the day of Monday. Of <laughs> let me do this again. Uh, it's 21 hours and 45 minutes into the day of Friday, May 9th, 2014. This is the beginning of uh, the Bass. Uh, bass vlog. This is part, beginning of the new uh, Insta vlogs that will lead us into uh, Bass TV. And where are we going on this? Well, we have a large chunk to put in here for the bass vlog because we are going to be bringing back the uh, we're going to be bringing back the Adventures in the Library series. The Adventures in the Library series. Uh, it really looks at uh, the exploration of uh, research in in li in library research, library science. Uh, I have a lot of books here like this. This is where I do a large chunk of my reading. So back here, when we sit back here, we will be going into some of the books. We will be going into some of the research into this. Uh, we were looking up histories of words. That will be the first series. Is in this is a sort of bring back one of the series. Uh, Adventure Library can be, can cover a variety of different books or a variety of different forms of library study. In this case here, we're going to be doing a dictionary study. Uh, we're going to be taking a term, following it through the dictionary. Let me just give you the di dictionary here. So we have a dictionary. These are old dictionaries. I really do enjoy collecting old dictionaries. This is an old dictionary here. This is a, Webster, a Web, old, old Webster's dictionary. I think this is 1930-1940. Um, what will be happening is I'll go on looking at a word here. And then tracing it through uh, the dictionary itself, and then from the dictionary going into an, an encyclopedia. I have the encyclopedia here. I can show you. Oh, <laughs> this does take a bit of effort because the books are heavy. Here we go. There's this encyclopedia here, and as I said, I enjoy collecting old books. I enjoy collecting these old encyclopedias too. The reason being is if you go into these encyclopedias, particularly before 1960, there's a lot of information that has been removed from the newer textbooks, from the newer texts. There's a lot of hidden information in them that as we go through, and you'll see this uh, as we explore different words and do the research between, these two, between, between those two books, uh, we, we see how these words have evolved. We can go into... Uh, some of the understandings that society has had, if we want to put it that way. I mean, we, we, we can take our understandings of what we're doing here, in term, and this is sort of the beginning work of going into the studies of antiquity. See, studies, studies in antiquities is actually a rather complex thing, because you have to do translations. There's a lot of work that's not in your own language. In order to go back into antiquities, you first have to understand the history the current history that's beyond you, that's not within your own current history. So you go to books that were around before you were around. 
And this gives you a look into history that you can't change. You can't change how this book is written. You can't change how this book is written. You have no influence on it. So now it becomes more objective. And so you have to go through here and get, it, get an understanding of what was understood at this particular when these people wrote these wrote this book here. What was the common knowledge of this particular time? And this is the same thing has to be true for here. Also, different companies, different publishers have different views, they have different ideas, and you can sort of go through and sort of put together a mindset of the period that you're looking at within these two particular period within these with these particular within these two particular book <clears throat> within these two particular books. The same thing can be done when you go into older literature, particularly if you're going into uh, uh, these ancient archives, you're going into ancient la languages like Greek or um, uh, Aramaic or Syriac. Or, and, and the thing is, these languages are rather difficult to get into because th they are more older. There is a different mindset. Just because you translate, translate something... Uh, Literally, it does not necessarily mean what you think it's going to mean because there isn't always a literal translation translation from one language to another. The, in many cases, if the language is trying to, uh, or, or the author in his own language is trying to imply something rather than being stated and explicit, uh, that implicit statement, the implications of the statement, can be lost in translation. You can lose the understanding that, that, that was trying to be put forward. Uh, and so what happens is that you really do, in antiquities, you do have to study languages, you do have to study here history, you do have to study uh, 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 periods, and understand how experience translates from the physical experience itself into the academic and written word. And the thing is, this is what's, what, what is the complex part. If you are a writer and you have experience in writing, you know that it is difficult to take the thoughts in your mind, never, never, never mind the experience, but just the, the thoughts in your mind, and translate them to paper and have, a, and have a coherent thought form on the piece of paper. Part of the practice of what I'm doing here, when I'm talking to you and doing the videos, is going from my mind to my mouth and having a coherent sentence, having a coherent topic, trying to f form my words in a proper manner so that uh, I'm not stammering and studying. And that, uh, that happens a lot. You do start to stammer and stutter. If, if your thinking is delayed and what you want to say does not process properly, then there is a delay and there's the um. If you hear people talk about, and I've done this, I do this myself, I go um or I stutter, that means the thought process is not following through from my mind to my mouth, and there is a difference between mind and brain. I will explain this in this in, in this series as well. We will go into, uh, and particularly on this channel, we'll go into the difference between the mind and the brain. Now, Western thought says there is no difference between the mind and the brain. The mind and the brain are one and the same. Yet there is no physical proof of this. Uh, and the thing is, in order to say there is a, that 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 something is, you need to have physical proof. You need to have scientific proof. Unfortunately, physics, particularly modern physics, quantum physics, rules that out because modern physics says you cannot know something absolutely. You can only know things to a certain degree of certainty. In other words, there is always a degree of uncertainty in whatever you know. So knowledge, absolute knowledge is asymptotic. You can't approach it and therefore you can never have an absolute proof of anything. You can only have a degree of experience in something, a degree of knowledge in something. And in the Eastern thought, which is different from the Western thought, Western thought divorces thought from experience. So you can have a concept, and the concept can be great and fine, but not connect with experience because in Western thought, in Western ide ideology, concept is, is what rules. The mind rules over everything, and concept does not have to meet reality. In Eastern thought, that's completely different. In Eastern thought and Asian thought, that's completely different. In Asian thought and Eastern thought, experience and, and concept, experience and thought have to integrate. In other words, there is, in every thought that you have in, or understanding that you have in Eastern thought, in Eastern theology, in, in Asian thought and Asian theology, there is a deep 
exper experiential. Uh, there's a deep experience in there. There, there is not simply something that pops into your mind and that's it. So when you're working on this, and, and, and you need to understand these texts are in, in many cases written like this, you have to go in and understand what's the experience behind the text. And this is what I've talked about before. I've talked about the level of knowledge. And your first level of knowledge is the immediate what you see. The second level of knowledge is what you read. But beyond what you read, you have the next going. You're, 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 and this is where most universities stop out. Most people stop off, even when they have more advanced degrees, they stop off at the Western, Western thought that reading is enough. But reading isn't enough. You have to go further. You have to understand how experience influences writing, and then how writing, in, in terms of what you're reading, can be viewed as experience. In other words, they, th there's two sides to it. Experience translates to writing. That's the author using his experience to write. And then the reader, seeing and understanding as much as possible, the experience of the writer, the experience of the author. That is the, that is the fourth and final level. But these two levels are pretty much integrated. It's hard to do one without the other. But they're also very complex because you're trying to understand somebody else's mind and you're trying to ex understand experience through somebody else's mind as well. So, it, you, you, again, you're running into that whole problem that uh, knowledge is asymptotic. You will not have a full understanding of what somebody is trying to do or trying to say or trying to um, relate uh, you won't understand their experience completely. You'll have an understanding of it, but you won't have a full understanding. In other words, your understanding will simply be asymptotic. It will be uh, within the limit if you want to go back to calculus. Uh, calculus has the, the function called the limit. The limit tells you, and this is, this is dealing with asymptotic slopes, uh, you can only approach a particular slope or a particular point in space and time. So your asymptotic curves looks like something like this. Here's your y-axis. Here's your x-axis. And imagine the line barely touching the y-axis, going down, curving, and then barely touching the x-axis. Well, on both those points there on x and y are your asymptotes. Uh, and the asymptotes, what they do is you can only approach the asymptote. You can never actually reach it. So you can only say that in the limit, you it, it appears to be that you've reached the limit. In other words, uh, there's, they say... They say the argument is is that at some point in time you can say that uh, you have such an understanding that you've approached full knowledge even though you really haven't. Uh, they're saying this as mathematically and that's what the, the, the whole mathematical concept behind limits are. This Limits brings you into to derivatives and limits derivatives and then from derivatives you go integrals. This is the fundamentals of calculus. So all of calculus is based on this concept of uh, infinity, bound infinity, if you will, too, um, where you only have uh, understanding of something within a certain degree of limits. There's a certain limit to what you can understand or how much you can understand, and that's why they talk about in the limits. So, uh, <laughs> and this is where we're coming with, with authors, too, is that you... In this situation here, this brings you, uh, going into antiquity, this, the antiquity studies, it brings you into the very limits of calculus. It brings you into the limits of understanding and to the limits of knowledge. Uh, and it's actually quite, it is quite fascinating because you, 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 we tend to throw things out, particularly ideas, out, uh, that if they're not accepted by an authorized group of people who are who call esteemed scholars, and people, and this is what, what sort of, <laughs> and uses me, you'll see particularly younger people who become enthralled with academics. And they're out there to correct people's incorrections, you know, their, their incorrect thoughts. And they'll say, well, scholars believe, right? And what, what happens is so scholars becomes an anonymous group of people. And then they'll quote some scholarly thought. But the problem with that is they're not talking. They're talking. They're not talking from experience. They're not talking from what they know. And then you can see this when someone says, "Well, scholars feel or scholars believe," 
and they use this as an academic an academic argument, you know that the experience is lacking, that there is no experience, that they're simply quoting somebody else's work, uh, and they feel that they've now assumed this work because they have this level of knowledge, uh, they've assumed their level of knowledge. Uh, but again, it's, in, it, it's still within the first two steps. It's still within the, the whole concept of reading and writing. They're still within the reading and writing phase of things. They haven't actually gone into the real analysis. They haven't gone past, past the reading and writing stage into uh, writing as experience, into reading as experience. They haven't gone past that, that initial stage there. And as I say, most people, even, even people at the PhD levels and beyond, never go past that, 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 that first two stages of of understanding the first two stages of knowledge. And it is a complex task to do that. It's not an easy thing to do. So I'm not knocking them, but it is sort of saying is it does, you know, when I, particularly when you're dealing with younger people on YouTube, they've got their first two years of, uh, uh, of uh, <laughs> university under, uh, under their belt. And, you know, they've taken some courses, some introductory courses, and all of a sudden they're fountains of knowledge and they're out there, you know, professing to the world what they know. <laughs> and I, I don't. And the thing is, I don't mean to knock that. I'm not going there to knock them, saying, "Oh, you shouldn't be doing that." But it, you do have to come bring in the idea that you know what? Yes, you do know a lot now, but what you don't realize is there's so much more out there that you, that when you go into university, when you take that down, go down that. If you choose to go down the academic route, you're opening a door. And the silly thing to do is. As soon as you get into university, to close that door and assume that you have this knowledge that others don't. And assume, then that's what happens. When you take the assumption of knowledge, when you take the, um, the assumption of superiority in knowledge to, to, to somebody else, what you're doing is you're shutting the door to further knowledge. You're, you're shutting the door to academics. You're shutting the door to open exploration. Uh, and you lose the understanding that you're simply at the beginning. first two years... As much knowledge as you think you've learned in that first two years, as great as you think you are, you've only begun. And I, 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 I sort of, I, I've experienced it. I've, I've been down that path where, yeah, first two years, hey, I'm something great. It wasn't until I got beyond my first two years and still and started asking questions uh, beyond what I was supposed to be asking. I started, you know. Think about what the professors were telling me. Think about what I was learning in class, and I said, "Well, how do the pro I, and this is kind of what pops in my mind. That's what gets me into a lot of trouble. I ask questions that I'm not supposed to be asking. I ask the question to the professors. Well, how do you know what you're teaching is right? You know, who who gave you this proof? And to a certain degree, you can see was some, that they had uh, had an understanding of things through experience that, that you didn't have simply because they had the experience." But beyond that, what was beyond that? And then when, when they sat down trying to explain it, they could only explain to their particular experience, but they couldn't explain beyond their experience. And that's where I began to wonder, I said, is there more to what's being taught in the first and second year, the reading and writing? And as I began to ask that question, I began to sort of search for the answer, and that's sort of where my unit, this is where my institute started. This was more than 20 years ago. Uh, I found an unbelievably large puzzle, and this is where I eventually became open exploration of the universe, is that, uh, and it, 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 I don't have to be out in space to do this. Simply in a library, and this was the amazing part to me, you know, I had sort of been doing... Uh, graduated up to, by my second year of university, I was doing 3,000 piece puzzles. And I wanted something more challenging. And as I started moving into this whole question here of what was beyond uh, our standard knowledge and our standard experience, and this was within, this was in sort of, because there was a whole bunch of problems within quantum physics that, you know, you started looking at some of these books, and I'll give you the example of one of the books I was actually looking at. And this is, it was called The Cosmic Code. Uh, and the author here, the author here, uh, describes his meeting with Einstein and a whole bunch of other other physicists. And the thing is, is that what they explained in here, what he explained in here, and the experiences of the physicists in there, did not meet what I was being taught in school. They were talking about something completely. The ideology was completely different. 
Even though you were learning about Einstein in school, even though you were learning about physics in school, even though you were learning, learning about astronomy in school, the thought process that went on, on inside the minds of the scientists themselves, the, the, like Einstein, was completely different. And, that, and when you start, start looking at the, bio, the, the biography, who these people were, it, it, a lot of what you were learning in, in, in university simply didn't make sense. They said, there's something missing here. And so as you start saying, well, well, there's something missing, the next question is, well, how do I find out what's missing, particularly if I don't know what it, what's missing? I don't know what's missing, because I've never experienced it before. So how do you then go out and uh, uh, find that out? And so my simple solution was, well, uh, I'm going to do uh, what, I, what I've learned in quantum physics, was something known about the random walk. I'm going to go out there, simply take a random walk around, pick things up that I find interesting, bring them back, uh, and as my collection grows, and I start to look at my collection more and more, I can group things that are similar. I can sort of, you know, do comparisons, and that's how my experience grows. Then, as my experience gro my experience grows, so too should my understanding. And this is sort of, in, in many ways, it became the ultimate puzzle. It became the puzzle that had no bounds, had no limits. There was no borders. And the pieces of the puzzle were scattered literally all over the universe, and I had no idea where they were. It was simply a matter of going out. There wasn't any particular starting point. Going out, picking a point, starting from there, and then sort of continuing along. This was the beginning of my op the opening of my mind, and when it opened up, when I saw what was out there, it was um it was completely mind blowing. It still is mind blowing to me today. Uh, Twenty years on, it is still mind blowing to me today. I still haven't gone gotten past that initial excitement. This is why I often talk about you know, people. people why, I, why do I refer to myself as an infinite tween? Well, I'm infinitely inside of middle school. Middle school is basically my life revolves from grade four to grade eight, grade nine at the, at the most, and and this keeps going back and forth in, in an infinite loop. And the reason why, I have the same feelings. And there are no rules. I have no idea what's going to be ahead of me the next day. I have no idea what limits I'm going to try to break the next day. Or what I'm going to succeed at. What I'm going to fail at. And, and the thing is, failure now is something that I'm comfortable with. I know that I'm going to fail at things. And it's not a problem. Because if I fail at something, well, okay, I failed at something. But what in, in, in that failure did I learn something? What pieces of knowledge they gain in that failure in that because every time you experience something whether it's successful or not successful you have experience in there and because you have experience you've now gained knowledge and I think is that's how you go back and find your little pieces and as your pieces start to grow and you know and the thing is this is it 3,000 piece puzzles right if you, 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 20 piece puzzles they're big pieces right kids puzzle they're very big pieces 3,000 piece puzzles they're very tiny little pieces and these pieces group together and make other bigger pieces. And so this is the same situation here. You, you, from failure, you can t take these tiny little pieces of experience. And as they start growing, you, you have your experience grow, grow more and more and more, the pieces of the puzzle start growing. The piece starts to grow. And you're not going fin to finish the puzzle. What you're going to do is you hope to finish a piece of the puzzle. And I've talked about this before in my vlogs. In, in the BTS vlog about the pieces of the puzzle. Well, this is it. These are pieces of the And uh, this is the puzzle expanding. The pu I haven't finished the puzzle. These aren't the... This isn't the border. These are the pieces, you know, expanding outwards. Explo you know, exploding outwards. This is what we're experiencing here. And the thing is, when you go into history, and you go into the history, and, and, and I said, this is, this is going to be an example uh, with, these two, with the two books, with the dictionary and the encyclopedia. Going here is going to be an example of stepping beyond my own knowledge and looking at books and history as knowledge itself, as experience itself. Uh, so in other words, I'm going to try to gain experience from the books here. And, and I'm going to be sort of demonstrating this to you. Uh, so this is going to be, uh, and this is where the, uh, the uh, Adventures in the Library comes in. Because you can't have Adventures in the Library. Once you understand that experience is connected to authorship, then what you understand is that all experience is gathered in a library. Libraries are simply a collection of experience. So a library now, instead of becoming a collection simply of books, 
can be a collection of artifacts, like a historical fact, artifacts, or a museum is a library. All museums are a library. And it doesn't matter how, and, 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 and I've learned that libraries don't have to be large. Libraries can be small. And there are offbeat collections. There are things, you know, you go look past this tiny little place and say, oh, that collection's tiny. What am I going to find in there? Well, you never know what you're going to find in there. I mean, some of my best finds for, uh, for old books have been in places that I never would have thought to look in the first place. You know, I was simply walking past it, going on my, uh, on my, <laughs> I'm a real wanderer. I don't stay put in one place for too long, and then I just start wandering around. Uh, that's kind of why I like my hiking and everything. So, because uh, <laughs> I do have that 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 that, uh, um, that sort of drive to wander and sort of uh, look at things that I had never intended to look at, and that's I, I think this is where a lot of the tangents come in for when I'm talking about you know all inter another interrupt coming along. I never get to what I plan to do because there's so many interrupts along the way. Uh, that's, that's kind of sort of my life has sort of fallen into this pattern of open exploration of the random walk, and that's kind of how I live my life. And, and the progress, as we're talking about here, uh, comes as the eventual movement uh, forward. And it's not a full movement, it's not a direct movement forward, it's a meandering forward <laughs> with some stretching backwards as well. Uh, but as I said, what we're going to be trying to do is, is start taking this, this concept of libraries of experience and looking at it within these two particular books and as what we're doing is we're going outside of our own particular knowledge, our own particular experience, uh, and looking at somebody else's understanding of history, of knowledge, and um, experience. Uh, this will help me out with my Greek because I am doing the Greek, uh, but I'm doing it associated with the church. It's, 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 uh, the church is an ancient church. It's connected all the way back to the time of Christ. Uh, so from there you go from uh, you can go all go from the modern Greek all the way back to the Greek uh, that was common within the Roman Empire at the, around the Byzantine. So that takes you right into the Byzantine antiquities, right into the Byzantine Empire, right into the Roman part of the empire that spoke Greek, and then you can get into history. You can get into you can get into to Aramaic. You can get into Syriac. You can get into a lot of the Semitic languages there. Uh, you can get into Coptic. This, the, the, the Coptic language is also an extremely important language to learn uh, if you're going into history because it does have a great connection. But again, the connection getting into the Coptic language is you go through Greek. But the thing is, is that there's a bit of experience kind of missing here because you look into history and I've done this sort of looking at different documentaries. What you'll find is that some of the documentaries will take you, uh, particularly from Babylon, you don't go west to Egypt, but you go east to India, and then from India you go east further into uh, the Asian cultures of China, Japan, uh, Vietnam, and these particular areas here, in, in, in the areas there, including uh, I almost forgot India. Uh, so you have a, in addition to a Greek path going, going there, going down to the Greek path, you also have a, a path of knowledge going from Chinese and, and Japanese into the ancient languages uh, of Sumeria, India, and th that sort of experience there. So histories on both sides are important, uh, and you really start to have to sort of realize that you know, there's a large chunk of uh, puzzle out there that's still really missing that has to sort of be put together. Anyways, uh... <laughs> That's going to sort of be it for our half hour. I think this is a good half hour discussion. <laughs> the description is not going to be that descriptive. Like, there's no way to put all the stuff in here. This is simply our, our discussion uh, the, the as you come to these particular understandings. So anyways, that's it. I will see you guys uh, for the next vlog. Uh, uh, who knows when. <laughs> Alright, take it easy.